This past weekend, I gave a talk at an atheist conference about the history of the Christian film industry. And, and obviously, I've been looking forward to that for a lot of reasons. It's the first time I've gathered with a group of like-minded people or any kind of people, for that matter, since the beginning of the pandemic. It was the first time in two years that I got to see some of my old friends from the circuit, meet any new listeners, watch presentations, mingle with fellow atheists. And obviously, you know, I was looking forward to it for all of those reasons. But another reason I was looking forward to it is that I came across something really interesting while researching for my talk. And I've been wanting to do a diatribe about it now for months, but I didn't want to spoil the talk. And now I can talk about it. So it started when I was trying to figure out where to start my presentation. I'm, I'm doing the oral history of the Christian film industry. So where does that begin? Right now, my initial supposition was that the Christian film industry started at the same time that the regular film industry started. I figured either contemporaneously with or shortly after the rise of the movie theater, you'd see a rise of evangelicals trying to cram them full of Jesus movies. But it turns out that that's not actually the case. I mean, sure, there were biblical movies from the very beginning, but those were mostly excuses to show sex and violence in a way that pastors found hard to protest. The idea of a distinct Christian film industry doesn't show up until the late 1960s, 1968 to be exact. So what happened in 1968? Well, that's the year that the Motion Picture Association of America adopted the letter-based grading system for movies, G, P, G, R, etc. See, until then, every movie had to essentially be G. All motion pictures, regardless of their intended audiences, were governed by a strict and laughably prudish set of rules called the Motion Picture Production Code. It had 36 rules altogether, but there were 11 that were given primacy in a very thou shalt not manner. Right, The other 25 are subjects that they urge filmmakers to take special care to present such that, quote, vulgarity and suggestiveness may be eliminated, end quote. But the first 11 are don't do this or your movie can't be shown in theaters type shit. Now, in my talk, I went over all 11 of them, but for the purposes of this diatribe, we just need to worry about rule number 10. After a bunch of rules banning even the most milk toast of profanities and any acknowledgement that humans have genitals, you get this rule that bans, quote, ridicule of the clergy, end quote. It comes right after the only good rule on the list, actually, the, the, the one that bans the showing of children's sex organs, which honestly makes you feel like this was an Owen oh, speaking of which type situation, right? Like somebody suggested the rule against showing kid dicks and Ed was like, well, then Father O'Flannery is out. And then somebody else was like, oh, so none of what Ed just did. None of that either. So, yeah. So further evidence that where children's sex organs are, the clergy is soon to follow. But the reason I bring it up is to remind you of just what a protected class the clergy has historically been in this country. These rules were adopted in 1927, and they remained in effect until 1968. And I should emphasize that there's no rule that says you can't ridicule police officers or American soldiers or the president of the United States. Unless you count God of the universe as an occupation, clergy is the only job protected on that list. And that's why, right? Because making fun of the clergy was tantamount to making fun of God himself. Criticizing the clergy was a form of blasphemy. Is it any wonder then that they were so easily able to insulate a global child rape cabal without arousing public notice for centuries? Now, look, obviously, I'm not trying to absolve any religious institution from its responsibility in child sex abuse of all the things I'm not trying to do. That might be the one I'm not trying to do the hardest, but it's an all but inevitable outcome of religion in the form that we know it today. If God is above reproach, then God is above criticism. And since God will never be able to speak for himself, we'll always have to rely on humans to do the communicating for him. As long as we cling to the societal delusion that there's a real God at the heart of all of this shit, those humans will always get a little bit of transitive infallibility. Hell, that, that's the whole reason we have taboos against blasphemy, right? Like a fucking real omnipotent being wouldn't be threatened by some asshole making fun of him, but a human being whose entire claim to power rests on a socially enforced respect for that omnipotent being sure as hell would. Through any other lens, it's insane for the first three of the Ten Commandments to be all about acknowledging God's godness. Like a, a real God's powers would be unaffected by people's belief in him or respect for him. But as soon as you remember that the person actually soaking up all that authority is the same one writing the rules and that, of course, their powers are entirely dependent on that socially enforced acquiescence, it all makes sense. Look, we get chastised sometimes, even from within the atheist community, for being too adversarial. Well-meaning listeners and prominent people in the movement will urge us to dial it back, tune it down, be nicer to the clergy. Many priests, after all, are just genuinely good people trying to do the right thing. But it's worth remembering just how young our ability to even acknowledge otherwise 
actually is. You couldn't make fun of a priest in a movie or, or even make an earnest point that criticized them without being banned from theaters all the way up into the 1960s. And, you know, and it's not like we lifted the entire taboo against blasphemy in 1968. We just started allowing more than zero criticisms of clergy in movies. When our criticisms start sounding too harsh, you have to ask yourself whether it's a fair assessment or the byproduct of growing up in a world that's just barely over carving exemptions out to ridiculing one fucking type of job. But even if it isn't, right, even if they're right and we're carrying our ridicule farther than the circumstances call for, so the fuck what? Let the pendulum swing the other way for a bit. The ability to point out that the Roman Catholic leadership is entirely peopled with child rapist and child rapist enablers is a hard-won privilege. And maybe by doing things my way, we might risk making fun of people a little more than they deserve. But the risk on the other side is people getting away with child rape. I feel like those are the kind of outcomes where you just err on my side of the spectrum as your default.